Day 11 of Celebrate 21. We are so thrilled to continue to bring you some great sessions, great speakers, great information, and hopefully you're celebrating each and every day along with us. My name is Lisa Lozano, and I am a productivity coach with Century 21 University, and we have a fantastic uh, speaker with us here for you today, Mr. Cabot Brown is going to be running our session, Never One and Done, Get More Closings from Every Transaction. Right now, I think all of you can agree with me over there in the chat box, how many of you are struggling from a shortage of inventory in your neck of the woods? I know we are here in Northern California, and, and when we get that opportunity to have a transaction, we need to take those opportunities and leverage anything and everything that we can so that we can turn that one transaction into multiple transactions. And that is exactly what Cabot's going to do. I am going to let him start out by sharing a little bit more information about himself, but really looking forward to your participation and asking us those questions over there in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that for him. So when we have an opportunity, we will make Make sure to do the very best that we can to answer all of the questions that you have today right patricia says they have a shortage out in new jersey as well all right you guys well i am going to ask cabot to turn on his camera and join us here in this session hi cabot how are you doing today hey hey, hey i'm good how are you I'm doing fantastic. So appreciate you being here with us today and would just love to hear a little bit about you. And then I'm going to let you just take it away, Cabot. Awesome. Yes, thank you. I'm excited. I appreciate it. I hope everybody is having a fantastic Monday. Uh, if you're having a case of the Mondays, we're going to go, uh, we're going to try to be exciting for you so we can, we can get this thing moving along for you. But um, can you see my screen? Is that happening yet? Make sure we got that going. We are seeing you. I will let you know when we, we got the screen set up. Okay. All right. No worries. Um, so uh, just briefly about me. I, um, so I'm from the Tampa Bay area. Born and raised actually down here. I work for Century 21 Affiliated. I work in the greater Tampa Bay market. So Florida, sunshine. Got my, uh, my nice little kind of floral button down to, to just go with the theme. And um, I... Uh, Second, I've done, let's see, I've been in the business full time for two years. So I'm probably not your, maybe uh, the speaker you were expecting, but I promise you I can, I, I've got some things that I think uh, at least have worked for me that I think you'll be able to implement into your own business as well. Uh, my first full time year in real estate, I, uh, I was blessed to make Centurion. My second year last year, made Double Centurion. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very blessed for that. I'm not, not, not tooting my horn, but um, I'm going to show you really what I did and, and, and I'm, I'm thinking this can be something you can implement. Uh, in fact, I know it can be. I think you're gonna get some value from it. So I appreciate uh, pre appreciate you being here. Uh, Kevin, um, let's not discount your yourself because as you mentioned, you've only been in the industry for a couple of years and immediately went into you know, Centurion production again. And also this year, um, you were also a president's producer. So congratulations on yeah. all of your success. So it looks like Kevin, you. you are going to have to go ahead and um, set up your screen, your screen share okay. that did get removed once um, we turned off the screen. So go ahead and do that. Okay, and no problem. I'll let you know when you are all set and everything looks good. All right, let's see. And here. while he's doing that, yes, if you guys haven't noticed over in the chat box, Kelly is mentioning that if for some reason you have to leave a few minutes early or unable to attend the session or your internet goes out on you like mine did just earlier today, that this session is being recorded and can be played back at, um, at a later time. Tell me. Pardon me? Would you call him to come over here for a minute? Oh. Is he working? <laughs> Oh, we got a, we got somebody off mute. No, isn't that fun? Lisa, okay. can you see the you see yes. it now? Yes, okay. you're all set up now. I'm ready to go. Awesome. Okay, so let's dive right into it. I know time's ticking. Okay, who would love to have an extra one hundred ninety one thousand five hundred sixty dollars in their bank account right now? Okay, it's a no brainer, right? But let me break these numbers down for you. In 2020, I earned an extra $191,000 in commission See, after my brokerage there. split by doing the things, uh, by doing these things in my business. Again, this is extra income. 
All right. I'm, I'm humbled to speak with you today. Like I mentioned, uh, you know, I got a phone call to talk about this topic. I, uh, I was ecstatic. Okay. I'm a big believer that we as real estate agents are far too often chasing the transaction. We're neglecting the relationship and we're going out of business because of it. And the worst part is we, we probably don't even know we're doing it. All right. So $191,000. I think we can all agree that if I did nothing else in my business last year, except what I'm going to share with you today, and if I finished the year at $191,000, I would have still had a pretty prosperous year. I think that's fair to say. Uh, but this is where it gets interesting. Okay. This is $191,000 that fell into my lap. It came out of thin air. I stumbled upon it. Whatever analogy you want to use, it doesn't matter. I earned that money by implementing what I'm going to share with you today, okay? And you know what's equally important to pay attention to is that this is $191,000 that did not go to my competition. And you know Florida, like it's, you, you have to have a, I think you graduate with, with high school, everybody does with, with a real estate license. Everybody has a license down here. We have a lot of competition, over 18,000 in my market, okay? This is not a class on me tooting my own horn, okay? This is a class that I believe any agent can relate to, whether you're a part-timer, maybe this is your first year if you're a seasoned veteran, all right? In school, I was called a lot of things. Studious was never one of them, okay? If I can do this, you can do this. And we're not reinventing the wheel. We're, we're gonna get creative and we're just going back to the basics. So $191,000. Who can use that, right? I've never had anybody tell me that they want less money in their bank account. Unless, of course, tax time, you're maybe doing something fishy with the IRS, which is not my business anymore, but that's actually a great segue into uh, my story, okay? I used to be a cop. I served my community as a deputy sheriff. I did that all the way through 2018 and early into 2019, all right? I followed my father's footsteps. He served 38 years in law enforcement and was in charge of patrol. That's where I was assigned. I worked for him for two years. Um, that's before he retired. So during my tour of duty, I got married to my beautiful wife, Jenna. I, I knew we wanted to have children. All right. I read a story. I'm sorry. I read a study mm -hmm. the average life expectancy for a law enforcement officer after the retirement is five uh, years. I said, that might be that's not mm -hmm. the, the type of retirement that I want. Right. They do collect this data. It's how they how they compute the pensions that law enforcement officers are going to get. So for anybody that's ever watched the news for more than five minutes, you understand it's not the time to be a law enforcement officer in our country. So I knew I needed to make changes. I used to work the midnight shift. I worked 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I'd come home. My wife, she's a, she's a special education teacher. She'd be leaving to go to work. I'd say goodbye. I'd go back up into my office and I'd start working on my business. Okay, I'd work three or four hours. I'd sleep three or four hours. I don't recommend this, by the way. Talk to your healthcare professional if this is your story. But I'd go back to work at 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then my next day was off. So I would stay up straight. I'd go all the way to 37 hours, all right? I'd log off at 6 a.m., Say goodbye to my wife. She went to work. I'd go up and work. I'd work straight through until I hit hour 37 and I'd crash and I would crash hard. Okay. I'd have my next day off um, from my cop job. I'd focus only on real estate and then back to my cop job the next day. And the vicious cycle continued. I saved everything I could. I finally bought myself out of my cop job in early 2019. 2019 was my first full time year in real estate. I, I actually became a dad that year. So that's a, pic that's a picture of my, uh, my little princess, Isla. Um, despite me being busy with home life, I was blessed to make Centurion. And like I said, in 2020, that was my second year. I hit double Centurion. And I'm pretty confident Lisa can correct me. I don't think there's talks of triple Centurion, but um, I'm going for it anyway, okay? So that's probably way more of my personal life than you, you ever wanted to know. But I wanted to share that for the part-timers that are out there, okay? If you want it bad enough, you'll get it. It's just not going to be given to you. Okay. And I'm also sharing to show you that I'm not some seasoned veteran. Okay. I haven't been doing this for 20 plus years. I'm the new guy. I embrace being the new guy. Like every new dad, I'm, I'm hip. I'm cool. I've got dad jokes, right? So why can't a bicycle stand up by itself? It's too tired, right? I love your dad jokes and maybe even throw some in the chat. I'm always looking to add to my collection, but 
Um, in fact, these, these pictures are actually reminding me I'm focusing a little too much on my, uh, my dad bod lately, and, uh, but that's okay. So enough about me. Here we go. Um, I want to get into my recipe for success, and I'll preface with this. Every market is different. Every person is different. I'm sharing with you what, what has worked for me, and I am hope that you're able to implement some of this into your own business and be successful as well, okay? I'm, uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that uh, the words coming out of my mouth are going to be life-changing, okay? But what I will tell you is that if you implement what you learn from the words that are coming out of my mouth into your own real estate practice, and yes, I call it practice. My, my, mainly my sister's an attorney. I got to one-up her in the family, right? So if you implement this into your own business, it will be life-changing. Okay, so you ask yourself, why is this important to you? This can multiply your income. 191000 extra dollars can be life-changing. My daughter, Isla, 17 months old, her college is paid for. And yes, we're already saving for her wedding, Okay. It's life-changing. My wife and I cried when we dropped her off to our, our first day of daycare. Um, I wanted my wife to be able to stay at home, to just like my mom did with me. And we needed money to do this. So by implementing these practices, I increased my income 30%. So not only is her college paid off, but my wife now stays at home so we can enjoy these years. Okay. What you're going to hear is it's, it's recession-proof. It, it'll literally work in absolutely every market you ever encounter. I'm convinced of that. We all remember the 07, 08 housing crisis. Some of you lived it. You pivoted then, but you probably didn't think you'd be pivoting again 12 years later in a global pandemic, but here we are, okay? You can implement these practices, I'm convinced, in any market, and subtle changes to your business today will maximize the longevity of your empire. And you won't need to worry, is it a seller's market, is it a buyer's market, short sales, bank owned, you name it, okay? Your clients are gonna need a place to live. And I've got some questions for you. Did you know that you're leaving money on the table? Did you know that you're leaving money on the table? Because you are. I know you are. I used to think I wasn't, but I was. And it kind of makes you sick when you start realizing what you're leaving behind. So let me ask you, why did you get in this business? Why did you get in this business? To make money. I know you did. That's why I did. I always hear the answer to help people. Okay, you know, that's a good answer for the website, but you got into this business to make money. If you wanted to help people, go join a nonprofit, be a teacher, be a cop. I help people for 12 hours a day. In four years, I gave CPR 19 times. I've got two life-saving awards. Uh, for, for the math folks, let's not sit here and try to do my conversion on CPR to saving lives, okay? Those are separate calls. Those stats are tracked totally different. It's irrelevant, okay? You got into this business to make money. An epiphany came to me at, after every closing, right? So closing day. These are the best days, am I right? This is why we do real estate. You get social media posts. I love my job. Home is where the heart is. My clients are best. Even when they're not the best, that's what you're going to say. We all do that, right? And if you're like me, uh, that was when the chain stopped clicking, all right? You, you, that is the peak of the roller coaster. It's when the chain stopped clicking. So anybody that's ever been on a roller coaster, you get on there and then you go, you go back and you go click, 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 and up you go, okay? That's the exciting. Your adrenaline's pumping, heart's going, all right? You're doing the slow little turn, okay? There's a camera, right? Everybody waves their hands and then we start slowly going down and then boom, you get the rush and boom, you're out of business. The, the, the thrill is over. You, down you go. You level out. You, you know, when I first started, leveled out. That's when I went back to posting random blogs that I'd find on the internet to sound cool. Okay. I would call my ex-girlfriend's mom's sister because she's the only normal person in the family. And I, I would start scavenging for my next deal. It sucks. Let's be honest. We've all been there. I've been there. You've been there. Anyone that's been in real estate longer than four minutes has been there and it sucks. And then the next contract comes back up the roller coaster. We go, we start climbing, click, 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 click. And here we go up and down, up and down. Okay. The game changer for me is that I, I wanted to change it. I had an epiphany. Um, basically 
I re now remember, I'm not a seasoned veteran. My phone was not ringing off the hook with come with my house phone calls, okay? I need a better way to turn one closing into the next. And here's the kicker. By implementing these tactics in the next slides, I was still chasing the transaction. The change that I wanted in my business it came when I shifted my way of thinking, when I stopped looking at real estate as a transaction. And I started looking at real estate as a relationship, as a relationship building business. Mountains moved. That is when mountains moved for me and my business. Okay. Now, if this isn't a, a philosophical presentation. Uh, this is how to get more closings from every deal. But I wanted to share that because as you start snowballing your business, which will happen, Focus on the relationships, not the transactions, and you will grow exponentially. Transactions are important. It's way easier to implement systems that will help handle all of those transactions. And by the way, um, if, you, if you're worried about systems, Celebrate 21, uh, they had a, uh, an awesome presentation actually on systems. Sarah Padgett did that. I highly recommend going back and watching it. Um, I think it's still available. But uh, I believe that was on maybe March 1st, somewhere Monday, very early in, in, in the show, okay? But anyway, transactions are important, but I will argue all day that relationships matter most. Plus, I like to look at the bigger picture, all right? Not, not maybe the monthly or even the yearly breakdown. I'm planning now for where I want to be in five years. So building the relationships now will pay dividends later, I promise you. All right, so let's get down and dirty, okay? This is what I do. This is how I do it. Everyone's different. Every market is different. We talked about that. I'm confident that these tools can be implemented in any level, all right? So try them. What's there to lose? Step one, know your market, okay? Deeply understand the types of markets you serve. Emphasis is on deeply. I know that right now, the majority of the money coming into the Florida market is from California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, okay? Know that for your area. Check out this website. There's a website. It's called howmoneywalks.com, all right? And this website, what they do is they, they illustrate how the IRS has been tracking uh, the migration of Americans with their income across state and county lines. It's a neat tool. Uh, it's free. You can just do some research on there and stuff, um, but it, it allows you to understand really where the money is coming from into your market. Please understand that there are thousands of markets within your actual geographical market, okay? I serve the Tampa Bay area. Within Florida, right, within the Tampa Bay area, we not only have hundreds of suburbs, but we have homes on golf courses. We have homes with pools equestrian property. We've got new construction developments, historic districts. We have waterfront property and not just any waterfront property. We have lakefront, intercoastal, gulf front, bayfront, canal front, okay? Break these down into subcategories that work for you to get you a better standing of what you need to know, okay? And know it now so that you can be in the game later. Deep dive into your markets, okay? Deep dive into those. Okay, who are your buyers, right? Homes on golf courses, strong likelihood that your buyer plays or has an interest in golf, all right? So who are your sellers? And then these will sometimes come across obvious, right? Okay, golf course, who's our sellers? I didn't come to the presentation to learn this kind of easy stuff, but start with the basics, right? Um, and, and it'll get harder. Your acreage, define acreage properties. There's no right or wrong answer. You know, define it so you know it and then know where it is. How are you going to target those people, if you will? I won't say targeting. We can't say targeting real estate. How are you going to attract those folks to your business? All right. Also understand, though, that there are different markets at different price points. It's possible to have a seller's market uh, under $500,000 and a buyer's market over $500,000. Okay, that exists. Market, it's just, it's, it's one of those fun, sexy words that real estate agents use because it can mean about a million different things and nobody's ever going to call you out on it. All right, so deeply understand the markets you serve so you know how to serve them. And you understand this, it's going to make everything easier moving forward. Okay, I promise. Kevin? Sure. 
We have a quick question in here from Jill Evans, and she is asking, and you know, as you're talking about your relationships, your transactions that created that 191,000, how many relationships did that evolve or come to for you? Uh, for me, for that number was 17. There you go, Jill, 17 that transactions. It? That, and that's how I calculate those. Essentially, I just, uh, when I got called to do the presentation, I went through my stats essentially from last year. How did I get this business? Where'd that come from? Okay, what's that? What's my commission split? And go. Of course, that's pre-tax money. Government's going to get their cut, but what are you going to do? All right. Okay. Um, so that was a great question though. So, and every market will be different on that. All right. But when you get a new listing, so strategy, let's, let's break this down in a few different strategies. We have, when we have listings, um, really, if you, if you get one, okay, what are we going to do to turn that into more? Then what if we don't have listings? I've been there. We've all been there. And then maybe what if we only work with buyers or what if that's where we're at now in our business? All right. So we'll break these down in steps. So step two strategy for your listing. When you get a new listing, you need to evaluate everything. The neighborhood, the price point, the lifestyle, you cannot overanalyze your listing. Okay. Know everything anything and everything about it, but look at the big picture. Don't focus on four bedrooms, three baths, 2,000 square feet, all right? That's data that anybody can find. Look at the big picture. Who will want to live here? If I'm listing a golf course home, again, not far-fetched to think that somebody who enjoys golf is going to be my buyer. Likely, not always likely, all right? If I'm selling waterfronts, I'm doing a listing on a waterfront property, I'm not marketing that home to an equestrian audience. It sounds silly, but just break it down with the basics, right? Sell the lifestyle of that waterfront home. If it's a waterfront, right? Focus on boat owners, fishermen, outdoor enthusiasts, kayakers. Focus on the lifestyle that brings. Build a strategy to how to get that listing in their face. And this is kind of marketing 101 maybe, and, and just hear me out where we're going with this. But get that listing everywhere. Put it in their face, all right? Find interest groups on Facebook that are specific to the lifestyle. Join those groups. It's free. You join those groups. You might answer a couple questions, get approval by the admin. There may be or may not be um, various rules in the group. You're not here to make friends necessarily. You're here to sell a house and to really turn that into more money. Okay, so be respectful, but put that home in those groups. All right. And, and uh, not everybody in that group is, is going to be behind your house. We only need one buyer. All right. And when you're marketing these things, we can go into hashtag later. Again, not, not a presentation on social media, but we're going to tag these posts that we're doing, right? If it's a waterfront, we're going to use tags like boats, uh, boat lovers, new boat home, waterfront, waterfront home, fishing, fishing home, fishing at home, be creative, all right? You're, you're going to greatly expand your reach by appealing to those that are interested. And I know, as a guy that likes boats, I live in Florida, right? I scroll through boat pictures all the time when I have time when I have time, um, all the time when I am on my phone, not focused on what I should be doing. But uh, we all do that, okay? Um, so it might not be for the person that sees it, but there's a good chance that, A, I know they're going to be interested. B, who knows? They might know somebody in the market at the time. You're expanding your reach all the way around, all right? And you know what? What's the worst that's going to happen? You'll overmarket a home, okay? A seller will never be mad at you for overperforming your job, all right? And lastly, let's put it on local real estate Facebook pages. I know that sounds silly, but I promise you, a, the majority of the agents in your market are probably looking at Facebook and more than the MLS. And that could be you. And if it is, maybe let's reverse that. But other agents are, are put it in the face anywhere you can, strategy to get the face, the, the property in the face of the buyer, okay? Now, let's say, um, now that we have a listing, all right, let's say, let's focus on that. We had a listing. We already did some marketing side of it. So um, we have the listing. Do not stop there, okay? Don't focus on, I've got a listing. I've got to sell it. And then I got to go find the next listing, okay? Don't stop there. For those of you that are not listening, do not stop there. We want more. You're in a class. How do we turn this into more than one closing, all right? Circle prospecting is what worked for me. Every listing gets a minimum of two mailers. Now, I'm going to show you what those look like in a second, so don't worry. Before I do that, and that's a minimum, all right, we're, we're, this is what worked for me. I want to touch briefly on a lead capture system. Make sure you have a system in place. 
you are about to ask for business. Be ready to accept it. Whether you get yourself like a free Google voice number, maybe you have a separate phone line dedicated just to work. You know, I think every major carrier now, you can add a second line for maybe 10 bucks or something. Um, some of the CRMs even have numbers assigned to those accounts. There's a lot of options. Whatever you do, I highly recommend, and what worked for me was making sure that the system catching these leads could accommodate text messages. I'll, I'll explain that in a second on why, all right? But the important thing, important part of that, have a system in place for catching this business that you're going to ask for. And then answer your phone. It sounds simple. Answer your phone. If you respond to phone calls, voicemails, emails, text messages, you're better than 70% of agents in the Tampa, Florida market. Congratulations. Move down if that's your thing. Maybe not. We have a lot of agents, but happy to help you if you do. Okay. That's a self study I did. I'm just tired of put it this way. All right. Too many agents. Do you think prospects are going to just constantly blow your phone up over and over until you answer it? They're not. It's usually one and done. They're going to move right on to the next agent. Okay. So just make sure we're catching that data that we're asking for, catching this business that we're asking for. Open houses. I know um, for me, you know, this is, this is something that gets overlooked. Um, it's kind of become a strange topic during a pandemic, but what has worked for me tremendously is virtual open houses. Okay. What is a virtual open house? Easy answer here. It's whatever you want it to be. Okay. For me, it's a recorded, exclusive, branded, guided tour of the ins and outs of a listing. All right, and here's why I'm never going to stop doing them. Number one, I'm catching folks on their schedule all around the country. In fact, all around the world, I no longer have to make sure that they can make my two or three hours on a Saturday or on a Sunday. All right, they're watching the home that they might be interested in or you know area even online all right buyers can watch it on their time all right my audience is no longer going to be restricted to geographical area right there anywhere and i know because i just mentioned this earlier i know money and people are moving into my state from other markets california new york new jersey all those right do you know who's not booking a flight in the middle of a pandemic to come to your open house very likely could be your buyer, okay? So now we have another medium to put your listing in their face. And another, another reason I like doing this is I'm catching real contact information. We've all sat through the open house where, you know, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck came walking through because that's who signed in, right? You're catching real contact information, at least a real email address. And then I can de easily download that into my, my CRM. So remember I said freeze for me. Utilize Google Forms to have your viewers uh, sign up for, uh, to, to basically sign up to attend your virtual open house. And what's gonna happen is after they sign up, after you capture their information, the link's gonna get emailed to them automatically, one less thing to you, that you have to do. Um, and that's gonna be showing them, again, your exclusive branded guided tour of the home, all right? So that's just a cool tool. I've been implementing it, I'm not gonna stop. Um, and then you can actually take uh, maybe a Facebook, it's very easy to do a Facebook, Instagram post, something of those of, of that nature, um, maybe even do a sponsored ad, flip a couple pictures from the house, and then uh, they click sign up, they get uh, sign up on your form, they get sent the, the house, and then, you know, just have fun with it, have, have a good time with it. Um, maybe giveaway, just host like a watch party, maybe, maybe do a giveaway of some coffee, get creative, trying to boost your attendance, okay? But the, the critical part with all of that, follow up with those leads, okay? This is critical, follow up with those leads, okay? You know who's not going to watch your open house? Somebody that bought a house yesterday, okay? It's, it's irrelevant material to them. They're not in the market. That's perfectly okay. You know who is going to watch your open house? Anybody who has ever had any interest in real estate. It's in the follow-up game with those attendees that you can gauge their interest. But remember, we're, we're turning one closing into multiple deals here, all right? I never said these deals will be day after day after day after day, all right? If you figure that out, call me. But this is something we might need to work. It's the long game. We're playing a long game on these kind of leads, all right? But don't discredit the, oh, we were just looking, all right? Those folks, they're looking. They're looking for a reason. We need to find that reason out, all right? I've got to touch on professional marketing because uh, far too often it doesn't happen. It's in existence sometimes, but professional marketing, be proud of your product. 
whatever you do and whatever you put out, whatever, whether it brings a client right away or not, I promise you it is being watched. Okay. Consistency is key. What you're putting out there today is being watched harder than you think, and it will bring you business. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe, you know, certainly in the future, but it will bring you business. But just as equally, do not discredit this, just as equally, it will turn business away. If you don't take pride in your product, it's not going to sell. Have pride in what you're putting out there, okay? Uh, all right, so take well, more on that to come, but take some notes on these. Uh, we're about to get into these letters here, right? So take some notes on these, take a screenshot, maybe grab your phone. Uh, it doesn't matter, but um, if you have questions, of course, put them in the chat, all right? We're gonna dive into circle prospecting right now. This is what's worked, worked for me in my market, okay? Okay, here we go. When I put a home on the market, the day before it hits the MLS, when I know for 100% certain that I am going live with that home, I mail out this letter. Okay, the, the, that was important for compliances, but until I know it's happening, with a day before it's gonna go on the market, these are hitting the mailbox. I mail this letter out. Now pay attention, this letter brought me 11 listings last year, all right? In 2020, I picked up 11 listings of my extra income by these opportunities I created from trying, all right? Here's my new listing letter. Hey there, all right? We're doing a generic salutation. You don't have time for hi, Bob, hi, Mike, hi, Sally, hi, Rose, okay? Generic salutation. I just put your homeless, excuse me, I just put your neighbor's home on the market for $459,000. That's right, 123 Main Street is officially for sale. Make sure you change the address and the, and the price that should go out say, but I will say it, all right? I know friends make the best neighbors and I was hoping to see if you knew of anyone looking to move into the neighborhood, perhaps even a coworker or family member emphasize move into the neighborhood all right don't put your neighborhood if you do live in the neighborhood then certainly put move into our neighborhood but you're subconsciously becoming a resident of the neighborhood when you do that all right equally as important you should know the sale may impact the value of your home i never want to bother you with useless information but if you're interested in knowing what your home may be worth in today's market please reach out and yes I provide this without any cost or obligation in return. Excuse me. What am I accomplishing with this letter? I'm doing a few things. The obvious, I'm marketing my seller's home, which is what I told my seller I was going to do. All right. I'm introducing the home and myself to the neighborhood. Right. So you're introducing the home. That's simple, black and white it's in the text. The name recognition is coming because you're going to do a, you're going to sign this letter obviously so um name recognition in the neighborhood to other residents this is something um you you may not see it now but you're starting to pave the way to being the neighborhood expert and you're going to do that through consistency we're going to we're going to pound that all day okay remember consistency is key in becoming a familiar face to the neighborhood so this is the first step toward that goal right y'all everybody wants to be the neighborhood realtor okay and then, of course, from this letter, you're also going to get maybe some of the talking points amongst neighbors. You might get some gossip. Hey, you know, Bob's house is for sale. Yeah, I saw the letter, you know, that kind of thing. All right. But you know what else you're getting? You're getting credit for what other agents are not doing. And now you're going to start turning some heads. You're going to start seeing them spend it too, right? I've never seen a realtor do that. My agent didn't do, didn't, you know, didn't do that. Very cool. Uh, by the way, you want, I want to point this out. Do you know how many calls I get from folks telling me that they know so-and-so that wants to move into the neighborhood? Zero. Goose egg. To date, have not had one call. But you know how many calls I get from folks interested in learning about their new value, their new home value? Whether it changed or not, it could have, and they, they called me because of that. I had 11. 11 phone calls from that letter alone, all right? Here's a pro tip. handwrite the letter in blue ink okay i'm not saying do 180 of these just handwrite one again generic salutation on the letter all right this will increase for me it did this is going to increase the odds that the recipient actually reads your letter and no again all i do i don't handwrite all these i do one time i use a high quality printer my office or i'll go to you you know kinko's fedex any of those printing places office depot whatever you have near you use a high quality printer 
and make those photocopies, they're going to look like they are actually handwritten. It's going to increase, for me at least it did, it will increase your recipient. Who's gonna get this in the mail and not at least get through the first paragraph? You, you probably would, right? And then another pro tip on the very bottom, add a call to action, okay? There's two types of marketing, right? Brand recognition or call to action. We want them to do something. When I first started mailing these letters, I didn't really get that many phone calls, to be honest with you, I didn't. When I added a call to action, my response rate increased. And remember I mentioned earlier, have a system in place that can accommodate text messages. So, and I tell them that they can text this number. My responses are predominantly text messages. In fact, 92% of the responses that I receive first come in as a text message. I thought that was important. So obviously for because of lawyers, right? We gotta say, make sure any kind of state required disclosures are out there, check with your local board, you know, stay compliant, don't do anything you're not allowed to do. Um, but I said a minimum of two mailers on every listing, right? So Cabin? In the homes, yes, go ahead. <laughs> I, well, here, this is going to answer one question that just came through, but somebody, um, Linda's asking, in that neighborhood surrounding that property, how many letters do you recommend sending? How far to the left? How far to the right? I mean, is there a strategy in those letters that are going out? Yeah, so for me, um, I'm trying to do the entire neighborhood. I do understand, and especially in Florida, like we have a lot of neighborhoods that have a thousand homes, Okay. I'm usually capping everything at about 150 letters if it's one of those scenarios. We also have a lot in my, in kind of my farm market. I've got a lot of one lane, like kind of one street with cul-de-sacs at the ends that average between anywhere between 30 to 120 homes. I'm generally, I'm not going more. So not so much a quarter mile as it is at minimum, everybody on that street. Think of it as if you're that homeowner, where does that stop relevant? Where, where does that letter not become relevant to you? And I would focus there. So if you're in a gated community, right, I would probably mail that entire community if I can. If not, break it up in, in how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? Break it up where you can, do it where you financially feel comfortable. Postage is not you know, free um, and, and really pound it down. Uh, of course, closer to the target you can be, the better. But um, 100, 150 is really about my average mail piece. I don't know if that helps. No, great. And you're getting a lot of... Um compliments in the chat box just wanted you to know that and I, I just personally oh, cool. want to say I love the idea that you put the call to action kind of giving them the permission to text you because I do think today's population prefers it feels less intimidated by sending a text as opposed to picking up the phone and calling so I love that idea yeah a hundred percent right like I mean we all know if, you, if there's something you don't I don't know how this person's gonna be maybe I'll just shoot a message and then I can hopefully okay I tried <laughs> right so that's kind of that's the same thing that, that they're thinking too we use it in our own mentality. So, um, but yes, and, and kind of last on that, and the last question too. Yeah, when you think it's, so if you're in a community, it's all gated community, you have a thousand homes, you know, you probably, you know, Joe on the entire opposite side of the neighborhood might not have as much connection to that home. I would just break it down where you can, where you feel comfortable, but um, awesome question. So, okay, when, uh, so again, minimum two letters, right? Two mailers, here is the second one. When my listing sells, okay? Uh, when my listing sells, I'm mailing out this letter. It's called my, I call it my just sold letter. I'm not going to read this one. It's pretty self-explanatory, but um, do, do not mail this letter until all parties have signed. Okay. That's a pro tip. Don't just, you know, it's real estate. It's not over till it's over. When you are 100% sure that there will not be a ball dropped, send this letter out. All right. Um, you don't want to look like a liar. That's just not good for business. So, Anyway, um, so look at the first line here, or really the second. Okay, I just sold your neighbor's home for $459,000 or 123 Main Street, all right? I'm not doing both, okay? Um, I'm either saying the price or I'm saying the address. To me, both is an overkill. Uh, I'm still trying to hold on to the curiosity factor of the prospect. I want them reaching out for a little more info and then, of course, based on the neighborhood determines what I'm going to do. Am I going to say price or am I going to say address? If I'm in a neighborhood uh, that has million dollar homes and $200,000 townhomes, I'm not using price. I'm using address, okay? Because it's irrelevant to the million dollar seller that I sold a $200,000 house, okay? So if the neighbor has similar price points, though, uh, I'll use price, but I'll only use price 
if the sales price would be appealing to others, right? If my client had to get out quick, or maybe it was a fixer upper, and we priced probably below the threshold, okay, price might not look so appealing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use address on something like that. But I hope that makes sense. And again, pro tip again, blue ink, all right? If you can, write it out. You don't have to. I just, I, I, to me, it works. I would recommend it, okay? But what you're putting out there too is already starting to become a footprint. This is branding, if you will, right? Be consistent and you're going to start being recognizable. Here's a bonus for everybody. Um, this, is, uh, this is just what I call the fire sale letter. And if I anticipate a house to go on and off the market right away, right? We've all been in those listings like, wow, this seller took my advice and wow, we're pricing it right. All right. And then you throw that into this market we're in today, right? It's going to probably go quick. I'm using this one. I'm being short in the sweep. And I believe that consumers like bullet points. So I'm kind of saying the same thing twice. If they're not reading my quote lengthy paragraph, they're going to try to maybe hopefully hit my bullet points. Okay. One, two, three Main Street, 48 hours on the market, 22 showings, five offers, listed 235, sold 250. Just catch their attention. All right. And one can argue that the letter might be a little too long. You know, it is what it is. Tweak it, make it work for you. I like it. I've had a lot of good success with this one. So, um, okay. And uh, again, here it is, just blue ink, hand addressed envelopes. And I'm, I didn't even touch on that yet. Uh, these letters go into envelopes that are hand addressed. Yes, hand addressed, 150 still. Is it super frustrating, time consuming? Yes. Does my wife hate me for it? Yes. Uh, probably, but maybe not because it's been working. So, um, you know, that's what I do. I'm not saying you have to do it. I, for me, anytime I get a letter in the mail, even though I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's junk mail, I'm going to open that. Uh, not everybody will. And, and I do believe that if you're hand addressing something and using, this is the one I pulled out of some free webinar. I, I'll give Tom Ferry credit. I think that's where I heard it first, right? A stamp that's completely irrelevant. It's not your stationary, maybe your American flag, which I do love, of course, but um, maybe it's, a wedding invitation stamp or something that's a little bit more special holiday I've got a lot of leftover ones from Christmas cards okay I'm putting something in there because it's going to just kind of that's a little weird that's not what a fortune you know corporate America would be mailing out right so that's something to think about but consistency is key okay so moving into I know uh I hope we're doing good on time but okay step three this is for no listings these are strategies that I use when I had no listings how to make more sales from other sales okay <clears throat> maybe you're newer, uh, maybe you're in a slump with getting a listings or something. Maybe it's just, it's just like everybody else in this market. It's hard to find listings. Okay, here's what's worked for me. First, you need to figure out what do you want to sell? Define it. What do you want to sell? There's no right or wrong answer. You just be you. Be you. What do you want to sell? Okay, this is easier if you've already done a deep dive into your market, like we spoke about earlier, that's why it was an important step one, all right? But identify it, okay? Identify your sellers, where do they live? Literally, map it out, where do they live? Uh, is that a price point you wanna serve? What price point do you wanna serve? What does the home look like, all right? Define it. Then set up an MLS auto search, okay? You need to be the absolute first person, I guess technically second other than the listing agent, but you need to be the first general public uh, to, to know when a listing pops up for sale in a market that you want to be in, okay? You need to be notified immediately. When a home goes up for sale in your desired market, you need to get alerted, okay? Then go get it. And here's what I mean. Perception is reality, all right? Perception is reality. I'm going to say that a lot. Make business from their business. So you've got your auto search set up, Okay. You're out there being an awesome agent that you are. And then you look down, you get an email saying, hey, new listing in so-and-so, all right? Now it's up for sale. You're the first to know, okay? Here's what you're going to do. And remember, this is not your listing, okay? So this is much more time sensitive, all right? This, this can be delegated, all right? But, it, but if, you, if you don't have many listings, you may not be that busy. So the disadvantage you have though, and especially in this low inventory type market, uh, your disadvantage is time, and you don't have the pleasure of, of being prepared for this listing, okay? It's not your listing. It will catch you off guard, just like it's going to catch the rest of the neighborhood off guard. Your back's against the rope. So you've got to act fast, and I'm talking same day, okay? These letters, 
They go out uh, no later than the day after the home hits the market. Ideally, I'm gonna show you the letter in a second. Ideally, they go out the same day. That'd be best case scenario, but I will give you benefit of the doubt that maybe the mail had already been picked up. All right, so mail them as soon as possible. I'm gonna get to that letter. After the mailing, we're going to door knock. And I'm gonna tell you what to say too, all right? But be smart with this. Obviously, if there's rules against it, you know, omit this step, that's okay. You know your communities, your rules, your laws, all that, all that good stuff, okay? Um, but, but be consistent, okay? You must be consistent with this. If you're not going to commit to it, just don't do it. Don't waste your time and don't waste your money. Be, be comfortable where you are. There's no growth and comfort, but be there, okay? But it will pay dividends when you're consistent. It wastes your time when you're lazy. All right, so new listing hits the market. You're gonna mail that neighborhood. You're, um, sorry, um, you're going to, uh, this is what we're gonna send them. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> I'm not gonna read the letter again. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's actually very, very much, very close to uh, the, the first your listing letter. We're just not telling them that we're selling it because we're not gonna be liars, all right? You just letting them know, informing them will never be a bad thing. They're not gonna be mad at you for it, okay? Uh, but same pro tips as before. Hey, you know, Blue Ink, leave the call to action. Blue Ink, it's, uh, you've been working on that footprint. We're working on that branding. We're becoming the expert, all right? Now, once those are in the mail, we're gonna door knock the neighborhood. I like to do this right away. I like to do it before the mail arrives, but I'm a go-getter. That's just me. You know, you, you be you. Uh, I recommend knocking before. So you're not only going to knock the door, you're, you're going to door knock that neighborhood, but you're, whoever you're mailing it to, but you're also going to be bringing with you a marketing piece. Make a flyer. If you don't have time to make a flyer, print out an MLS info sheet. Make sure your information and the branding information is on the top. Okay, just like you would a customer synopsis anywhere else you go. All right, knock on the door. Here's what we're going to say. Hi, yes, we're gonna say it just like that, okay? If you follow me on social media, you know that I start every video with hi, it's kind of become my thing, um, but you appear harmless when they answer the door. Kind of like uh, Lisa's point, right? You're a little, maybe a little nervous, you're, you're inviting them to text you. Well, maybe we need to have a little invitation so that they feel okay opening the door for you. It, it, not everybody open the door, I'll tell you what to do when that doesn't happen, but all right, when I was a cop, you can imagine folks open the door and you see, me in a, in a police uniform, uh, I'm not going to say I'm a big buff person, but the ballistic vest made me look a little bit more fit than I was. So uh, I'll take it. But what I said, which helped them relax a little bit was, hi. All right. So for me, practice it. If you're there and you're driving in your car, whatever you're doing. Okay. Hi. I wanted to drop a quick card and let you know that your neighbor's house just went up for sale. If you know anyone looking to move into the neighborhood, please take my card. I would love the opportunity to assist them. All right. Now, when you say, please take my card, you are going to do the action of handing them your card with the flyer and the marketing piece. Okay. Uh, they will take it as you're still talking and you're just handing it to them. That's when they're going to take it. Okay. If not, you're going to learn the hard way. They're going to sound, no, thank you. Have a good day. Like it close the door on you. All right. So um, they will reach out for it. All right. Also practice some scripts. Here's the pro tip portion, right? Practice some scripts and be knowledgeable of that home, even though it's not your listing, but be knowledgeable of it because there's a strong likelihood they're gonna have questions. And it's usually these two questions, right? Hey, which house? You do not wanna be caught there standing and say, looking down at your sheets and uh, to, uh, I think it's gonna, so it's gonna be the third one on, you know, down on the right, right? You just know which house and how much it's listed for. Those are pretty much gonna be your two uh, your two big points. But um, another another pro tip that I like to share, uh, know the owner's last name of the house, right? So, oh, hey, which house? Oh, it's the Brown's house. Oh, it's the Johnson's house. Okay. Look it up on county records before you start knocking on doors. Know, uh, know the owner's last name. All right. You're going to sound like you're the agent. Okay. But you're not telling them you're the agent. Don't lie. If they ask you, uh, you know, don't tell them it's your listing if it's not your listing. If they ask, hey, is that, did you put that home up for sale, right? No, it's not my listing. I'm trying to help Cabot sell it. I'm trying to help Cabot sell the home. I'm trying to help 
Bill or Sally, whoever the listing agent is, okay? I would know that first thing, be able to answer it because you're not lying and, and you are. You, If they tell you, I know Bob, or I know so-and-so, they want to buy that house, I promise you, if they don't have an agent, you're going to try to help them and you're not lying. That's, you're doing what you can to help everybody, okay? Uh, all right, so if there's no answer at the door, you're going to leave a post-it note. I don't think I told you that, but make sure you're walking around with, oh, you can't really see them. Okay, here we go. Make sure you're walking around with post-it notes, okay? Here's what you're going to do. You're gonna pull it out of your pocket. They're not answering the door. You're gonna write, sorry, I, that's terrible penmanship. Don't write, sorry, and just don't misspell it like I just did. That's a little embarrassing. Sorry, I missed you, okay? So you're gonna write, sorry, I missed you. I know it's probably hard to see. All I wrote on here was, sorry, I missed you on this, on this uh, post-it. I'm taking my business card. I'm putting this post-it on my business card halfway, I'm using this post-it sticky nice tape and I'm taping that to the front door. That's it. I'm just taping it to the front door and I'm walking away, I'm moving on to the next house, okay? You will not get many calls from that, but the calls you do get, those are serious phone calls, okay? Those are going to be seller leads whether they tell you that or not, all right? Face it, who is going to come home, see that a real estate agent left their card and a script that said, sorry, I missed you on their door, okay? And then call you, right? Buy, people aren't gonna call you just to tell you they're not trying to buy or trying to sell. They're gonna probably call to inquire what you're doing and they really don't really, they, they don't care what you're doing unless it may or may not affect them. And so capture those leads, investigate it, talk about it, be a resource, okay? Uh, that's, those, are, those are important ones, all right? Um, let me see where we're at next. Sorry. Okay. Um, and then uh, I told you we're going to do. Go ahead. You have just a question. For clarif just for clarification, um, they were uh, asking how many letters is it similar to the same thing when you're doing your actual own circle prospecting? And then um, Anne was asking if you leave the flyer as well, but I think you just said you're just leaving that sticky note in your business card. Yeah. So part one to that same answer as before. I'm going to do that to not necessarily a defined geographical area. I'm not saying every 10 houses I'm done. I'm doing that to where I feel comfortable. What's the worst that can happen? I spend maybe five more minutes taking those stuffing envelopes and putting stamps. Okay. I might waste. When I say waste, I don't think I, brand recognition, that's, that's the other type of marketing. So they're going to open it. They're going to see your name. They're going to realize you're in real estate. agent. So I don't think you're wasting anything. It could get more expensive. I understand that aspect. So do it where you feel comfortable not, you know, don't limit yourself, but put, excuse me, put your own limits out there. All right. So if you, if that's where you want to be, and if it's not your listing, you don't think you have the marketing budget for it, maybe go smaller. That's okay. Um, but worst that can happen, you, you expand your name. All right. You may get out to that other seller. You, you're just building the neighborhood expert. All right. That's what I would do. And then second part, no, I'm not leaving the flyer really. Um, I, I haven't, I've tried it once, I should say, but it's like those old info tubes. I found that, um, they're either going to get wet or, you know, I'm not printing hard laminated, nice flyers necessarily. I'm going quick. I'm doing a, a print, printing hundred copies and going, and those are not going to keep well in the elements of being outside on a front door I found. So just my car, just a post-it that's, that's really about all I'm doing on them. Um, but uh, like I told you, every, uh, so those are all great questions. Um, I'm mailing twice though, okay? Remember it was our listing, we mailed twice. It's their listing, we're still gonna mail twice. So if you miss them at the door, it's another opportunity to get in there. You've already got, right? First, you're gonna, your, your first letter, you put it in the mail, then you knock on the door, then that first letter is gonna arrive, okay? Then when the home sells, I'm sending this letter, okay? This is the letter that I'm doing, um, you know, Basically right here, it, consistency is key. As homes go up for sale, all right? Um, as, homes go up for, as homes go up for sale in the markets you want to serve and you're doing this with every listing, you're being consistent, you're mailing on, sorry, you're mailing letters, you're hand addressing envelopes, you're knocking on doors, your face is going to become familiar, right? Remember, we don't have listings, we're still trying to find one, but your, your face is going to become familiar. The homeowners that you keep talking to, they're associating your face with home sale, all right? You've never told them that you're the one who actually put the home on the market, okay? Your actions 
are causing them to infer that you put the home on the market. And they keep seeing you, they keep seeing your face, your phone number, your name, your letters. They're assuming that all of these home sales are yours, right? So three or four listings go by and you've done this three or four different times. That's times two letters and door knocks, right? You've now got maybe 20 points or touch points on these folks. Okay, I'm not a math guy, but um, you know, even when none of these are your actual listings to that homeowner, you have sold all three or four of those listings. Okay, what do you think they're gonna do when it's time to list their home? Who do you think they're gonna call? They're gonna call you, all right? They're gonna call you because why? Everybody else in the neighborhood is doing it. They seem to be calling you, right? Perception is reality. Okay, so this is equally important. Um, I hope we're doing okay on time and stuff. Okay, so um, step four, strategy for buyers, right? Creating leverage with buyers. I'm gonna go through these a little faster. I don't wanna make sure we have time for questions at the end too. Um, strategy for buyers. When you wanna create leverage with buyers, it, it says, here's an important note, okay? This is titled for buyers, but really these points, they need to be implemented into your business practices every single day, okay? This is the bread and butter for turning one transaction into multiple closings. Quite frankly, it's the easiest to master and it's the easiest to screw up. All right, for me, buyers are easy to wow, they're easy to please, okay, but they're also easiest to fire you. They are not always the most loyal. All right, how many of you have ever worked super long hours for some buyers at absolute ridiculous times of the day? You tell them to call you anytime they have a question, but you really don't want to answer your phone after five. So of course you you they call you at 1130. They've got a question that definitely could have waited. You spend months with them. You show them hundreds of homes. And then finally, you go to take the vacation that you deserve. And they find the one, right? Okay. This is the house for them. Of course, it hits the market when you're gone because why not? That's what Murphy's Law says. And since you're out of town, they didn't want to bother you. So they call Realtor Joe and they buy the house just like that, right? It's happened to us at some point. And it used to happen to me. And then I realized it's because I never built the relationship. I focused more on the transaction than I did on building that relationship. And I didn't do this intentionally. It was just the product that I was putting out. Okay. I realized the same was true for the client. The client linked me to the transaction and not to a relationship. Okay. I didn't want that. I like closings, right? Don't we all? I like getting paid for the work that I put in. My wife loves Target. That's an expensive hobby, all right? But um, I changed the product that I was putting out. Okay. So I wanted to create an experience that is so exceptional that my clients would never consider calling another realtor. And to the same effect, I want to create an experience that's so amazing that it, it was one they wanted to tell others about, all right? I wanted walking billboards. So I used to be a cop, right? All right, as a cop, we get really good at asking questions. We get really good at reading body language. Unbeknownst to my cop, my, excuse me, my cops, unbeknownst to my clients, I am constantly interviewing them as we look for their dream home, okay? In all of my interactions. Whether they're in person or on the phone, I interview them. I pay particular attention to everything they're doing and saying and what they're not doing or saying, all right? Your clients are going to tell you a lot, not just about the house they want, all right? Don't, don't focus. It's not about the, how many bedrooms or bathrooms, okay? Listen more carefully. Look for the opportunity to wow them. Do they have kids? What are their names? What are their ages? Do they have pets? What type of pets? What are the pets names? What are their hobbies, their interests? Okay, do this naturally. Don't rapid fire questions. No, do this over time. Take notes on your showing when you're interacting on your phone calls. Okay, be detailed and meticulous with your notes. And these notes will be crucial as you build and strengthen your relationship over time. You're always gonna be adding to them. You're gonna be changing them. Very important to keep good notes, okay? Um, you ever walk through a house and the wife is like, wow, I can totally enjoy some wine in that bathtub, okay? Did you think to write down, or better yet, sorry, did you think to ask 
what kind of wine she likes? And of course, yes, write it down. Or maybe you've got a client, you walk around a house and they say, oh, I love that picture on the wall, right? Did you think to maybe be a little discreet, pull out your phone, take a picture of that picture? These are, these are I'll see where I'm going with that. But these are just a, a couple of silly examples, okay? But they start the wow effect, all right? And because about a year, what's gonna happen? About a year after they close, on their home anniversary, you're dropping off a bottle of her favorite wine and she has absolutely no clue how you knew that, okay? She's gonna be wowed. Or, you know, that picture on the wall I was talking about. You're reaching out to that other agent and maybe seeing from the seller, where'd they get that picture, all right? Maybe even better, would the seller be willing to leave the picture behind, right? Create that wow for your client. You're creating an experience they want to tell others about, all right? You're creating walking billboards. And by the way, you know what's gonna happen when you leave after you drop off that bottle of wine? There's going to be a social media post. It's 2021 and that's what people do. They look for excuses to put their business out there. Okay. Oh my gosh, y'all. My realtor just dropped off my favorite Cabernet. Isn't he the best, right? You're going to get those. And that's great marketing. You can't ask for anything better. Okay. So how do you wow? All right. Do you bring a small cooler of cold drinks and some snacks for your clients when you're showing homes, maybe a, even a small, simple toy if they have young children? Are you showing up on moving day in your gym clothes with a bunch of pizzas and a case of water ready to unload the truck? How do you wow? Are you answering questions before they ask them, right? Are you researching these properties that you're showing, finding out how old the roof is, how old the AC system is, right? Does the HOA allow basketball hoops? You can find out some of these things before they ask, you're going to wow them. So how do you wow? What do you do in your business that your clients want to brag to others about? If you build a relationship and you not focus on the transaction, you provide an exceptional experience, okay? They will send you more business, but you gotta earn it. Um, okay, so strategy for social media. Step five is our last kind of little step in here. Strategy for social media. These are steps for success. I'm going to tell you, this is, this is what helped me a little bit. I, um, this is not a social media presentation. I am not the guy they want talking about social media. In fact, I can't stand social media. Uh, I'm more of a live in the moment kind of, kind of guy, but you have to be on social media. Okay, let me rephrase that. You have to be active on social media. Just liking your cousin's Facebook post is not going to cut it, okay? There's money to be made on social media, and if you're not active, you're losing that money. I promise you, you are. What you need to realize about social media is that you are being watched. Like when we marketed that waterfront home and all those Facebook groups, you are being watched. Like it or not, you're being watched, okay? Even if you only get three likes on some post you did on Instagram, you are being watched. Here's a better way to think about it. You are being interviewed on social media, right? Remember we talked about all that stuff earlier. Those are interviews. You are being interviewed with every post you make. Your past clients, your future clients, your database, your followers, your friends, your family, their friends, their family. You have more eyes on you than you realize, probably more than you even want, but you need to be visible and you need to be okay with being visible. What you need to understand is that everything you are putting out there is being analyzed by someone. Be proud of the product you are putting out. If you're posting pictures of a new listing, other potential sellers are going to judge you on those pictures. Is that seller going to want to hire you to market their home? Are you proud of those pictures? I tell you something for you. Last year, I, I, I answered four come with me phone calls from sellers I did had no personal interaction with, excuse me, who in some way told me that they found me on social media and loved my marketing. That's it. All I did was, I did nothing else to solicit their business other than by marketing my own client's home. Okay. Again, not a self plug. I know there are many of other agents out there who, who probably got way more of those phone calls. Okay. But the point is, I was being watched by people I never knew were watching, and you are too. 
Okay, uh, so some pointers for you for social media, just because they were, they, these are big takeaways for me. All right, don't change for the camera. Okay, you be you, I said it earlier, you be you. That's the easiest way to say it. All right, the more relatable your content, the more connections you are going to make. All right, when work stinks, just show that work stinks. We all have bad days. We all have bad days at work. It happens, all right? Don't make all of your social media about real estate. I average 22 likes per post when it pertains to real estate. I average 147 likes per post when I post a picture of my daughter. All right, both posts equally important. I, I, if my wife hears that, okay, posts about my daughter way more important, but both posts have a purpose, all right? Um, I know that more than 22 people are seeing my new listing coming soon under contract. I know more than 22 people are seeing those posts. Okay, I'm building my brand with those followers. Whether they engage or not, they're watching. Okay, your interviewers are connecting with you personally and professionally on social media, whether you like it or not. And you know what? If they don't like it, they won't follow it. They don't have to follow you. All right. I hear uh, agents all the time. They say, uh, you know, hey, I, um, I don't want to post this because of that, or I don't want to post that because of this, all right? Nobody cares more about your content than you do. I promise you, and that's a harsh reality, but you're overanalyzing everything you do and everything you post and you need to stop it, all right? So here's what worked for me as to pertain to social media, some, some pointers that I do. I do a minimum of six posts per uh, transaction as it relates to real estate. I trickle in personal life all throughout. But I do a coming soon, I do a new listing post, an under contract, and a filler. I do closed, of course, closing day, right? And of, of course, I do a, a client picture because they're going to get tagged, everything they tagged, and the whole cycle continues. Now you're becoming a familiar face, you're branding, all right? When I say filler, you know, these are going to be really kind of in that part of the transaction when we're waiting on title work to be done. Um, you know, maybe I'll do a picture of the kitchen or, or the backyard. I'll say something like, hey, who... Who needs a new kitchen or who would like a kitchen like this or you know how about this backyard view something that's engaging engaging i'm just doing it to boost engagement ultimately okay um so uh looking forward you know let's go back to the basics if you do nothing else but focus on these practices you are going to increase your business there's no other possible scenario I'm not telling you to do nothing else. In fact, I would certainly tell you not to just do this, but if you only did this, you are going to see significant results, all right? It's impossible to make less by doing more. You're not going to fail. You just need to do it. Remember, this is an important, and this is an important thought for sure. Remember, it's about connection, not perfection. All right, I picked this up from Jared James. I wanna make sure he gets credit. Okay, but it's so true. When it comes to social media, when it comes to videos or, or anything linked to a relationship, the goal is connection, not perfection. Just think about this as, as, as a human, right? The goal is not, I'm not gonna, hey, I wanna make sure I say this perfectly when I call my friend who I haven't talked to in forever or my family member, whoever, right? The goal is connection. Just do that. You're gonna build a relationship by just connecting, okay? And then I'll even add in, right? It's all about connection, not perfection. I would add in there that if you wait for perfection, it's never going to come, all right? So time to apply this, right? Put it in the chat. I, uh, question for you, what's the one thing that you're going to be taking away and how are you going to implement this in your business, right? Let me ask this another way though. So first, you know, go in the chat for me, right? What's the one thing you're going to take away and how are you going to implement this into your business? But I'm going to ask it another way for you, right? How much money are you going to give your competition next year? How much money are you going to give your competition next year? I didn't force anyone to buy or sell a home last year, right? There were 17 transactions. Those folks, that business was going to happen with or without me. I just made sure I got my piece. Are you going to get your piece? What could you do? with 30% more commissions this year, all right? Pay off a car, pay off your kid's college, pay off your mortgage. Like many of you, I've sat in a lot of training around the country, and I'm a big believer that the day you stop learning in this profession is the day that you need to retire, all right? As a cop, we had a saying, complacency kills, all right? It has a much safer meaning now in my, in my line of work now, but the same is true, all right? 
one thing I noticed from my experience when I attended those trainings was that there was always a difference between the person who spoke on stage and the person who sat in the audience for good and for bad. Okay. But there was always a difference. The difference, it's always been clear to me, and it's simple. The difference is that one person wanted it more than the other. I see this in my own office. I see this in my own market. I've, I've seen it in every profession I've ever been in. He or she who wants it more gets it. The person who wants it more gets it. Okay, the difference is implementation. You've got some tools here. What are you going to do with it? Who's going to do it? Who's going to door knock, hand address envelopes, hand address letters, put them in the mail? Who's going to wow their clients? The truth is, some of you will, most of you won't, and other agents in your market are going to get deeper pockets and greater market share because they will and you won't. Right? I've been very blessed making Centurion my first year, double Centurion my second year. I'm not anyone special. I don't have access to things that you don't. I have the Century 21 system and I have the internet. There's a lot of free stuff on the internet. Okay. So be a doer, not a dreamer. That's all I got for you. <laughs> no, Kevin, you have a lot of really great comments coming through. Um, <clears throat> one that's uh, kind of really used to stick out that came in right away was, you know, just having a deep understanding of the market that they want to serve. And I think that's so important. But everyone is loving the suggestion of the two letter concept and they, the fact that you shared it with them, a, a lot of overwhelming gratitude for that. And I wanted to, a question here, kind of going back to that letter and doing the two emails that go out when that listing comes out, as well as at the closing time, are you focusing on your, well, you mentioned doing not just your listings, but other listings, but are you focusing on a specific neighborhood or are you taking any listing that comes available in town? Or are you kind of starting to build a, fa a farm and doing this consistent in, in order to manage your budget? The, the, the bad answer that you probably don't want to hear is all of the above, right? So <laughs> ultimately what I'm doing is I'm defining what I, what is, you know, I don't, I won't use farm necessarily because that term I feel just kind of really targets, say if I'm, you know, a box, let's just say, here's a box. And I, if I say a farm, I'm not going in or out of that box. To me, I'm targeting that market. And that market is sometimes price point. It's, it's a lot of times location. Um, quite frankly, I'm not mailing the other side of the, the neighborhood. I mean, another side of the town, just because, right? If I want to become the agent over there, I'm going to have to probably move there. I mean, driving back and forth is not going to be fun. So work where you want to work and don't shy. Like I don't shy away on price points, okay? You can change just, just by, here's a neighborhood. Here's, here's a great example on really how to get started, okay? Define in your own vision what, what you're looking at or what you want to make your market. Then go and see, is there a dominant agent? Just put the criteria in MLS, price point, zip code, draw a map, whatever you wanna do and however you wanna identify it, you know, waterfront, all these, whatever terms you can, or I guess filters you can apply in your MLS, do that and, and start looking, okay, here, here's market A. Market A, let's call it homes in my zip code, $300,000 or below, or 150 to 300, it doesn't matter. Is there a dominant agent in there? If there is, and I'm just starting, I'm probably not going to, to really dive into that market. And it's not because, not for any other reason, I'm a firm believer in <laughs> This, this is probably going to come across as cockiness. I don't mean that. It's confidence. I will go up with against anybody at all in my market, another market, in our company, another company, Oprah Winfrey, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go up against her on the, on the listing and I'm going to get it. Okay. And if I lose, I'm only going to lose that way once. I'll learn and I'll move on to the next one. But my point is I'm not shying away that another agent is dominant there. It's just going to be more expensive for me to infiltrate that market when I know, I mean, anybody that's ever been in an airplane, you take off, how many houses do you have? Now, I know we have, you know, this is Florida, my market's different. I'm sure there's some, you know, the, the population per capita is probably a lot more spread out in other markets. But um, my point is, I guess, you know, define what you want. Where do you want to be Mr. or Mrs. Agent? Where do you want to run the show? Find that market, and that's where I would go after. Yeah, a lot of people really liked your suggestion of setting up that new listing alert for the specific areas that are the price points that you really want to make sure that you're targeting. Another question is, um, along with the two 
you know, letters being sold for your particular properties. When you are hosting an open house for that, are you doing something via mail in, in addition to that? How, or is it going to be on social media? How are you getting back in front of that local neighborhood for that additional marketing when you're doing the open house? Okay. So if I think it, I do it, right? So it's free, social media is free. There's no reason not to be pushing an open house invitation out on your social media channels. Doesn't matter, just even if you do multiple, excuse me, I would do multiple, in fact. But when I'm knocking, it, it, it's kind of a, a, I won't say loaded question, but if it's my listing, I'm controlling that. I've already had those conversations with the seller. I know an open house is coming, then yes. I will try to find a way to introduce that in the script. You know, hey, friends, make the most neighbors, have an open house tomorrow at three, make sure you send them by or love to see you myself, whatever you want to say and, and, and make that in there. Um, you can make sure that you add that open house into the, at least in our MLS, add that open house info in there first. Um, so that way it prints out on maybe your flyer or your info sheet, highlight it, just do something to put it in their face. But yes, if it's not my listing, the odds of me doing that open house are really inexistent. Um, yeah, you know, if you're if you're newer, there's really most. What I found in this business, if you really want to learn from others, not many people are rude. Not many other agents are. I won't say that. Not everybody's a little bit more giving than others, but there's got to be. I know your broker, your resource, another uh, another senior agent, and I'm not even one, but there's a lot of people that would want to help you if you ask. What I find, kind of going back to the whole text message or phone call theory. Too many people are afraid to pick up the phone and ask somebody. So maybe tech, whatever. My point is talk to somebody, ask if you can do an open house. So maybe I won't target that farm that I want to be in. I might start just building my database. But, you know, yes, introduce the open house. Yes, put it out on as many platforms as you can. For me, social media is really probably my biggest thing. I work exclusively by referral. So I'm not uh, like, I'm, I'm very excited about that. But, um, you know, I'm not buying leads or Zillow or ads or any of those, that kind of thing. So I, um, I, I just, I've started small. The smartest thing I ever did back in like high school when I had a Blackberry, I thought I was cool to put everybody's address in my phone for no other reason other than I don't know why I said, maybe one day I'll need it, right? Fast forward 15 years later, I'm in real estate. This is great data to have. So start always, when you, when you get somebody's number, get everything you can about them, start building that database and then hit them for that, when that open house hit, do an email, email's free, right? Do whatever you can to just get that exposure for the open house. But that's what I'm doing. I'm doing social media. I'm, uh, I, I am, if I'm door knocking the neighborhood that I'm mailing and I know I'm hosting an open house, yes, I'm introducing that. Probably a longer answer than you wanted, but hopefully that helps. No, no, that's great. We have a, a little bit of time here. Another question is with technology and video. And you mentioned the opportunity that the virtual open house lends to you and being able to connect to those folks who are from out of state, prior to them coming to the area, starting to build that relationship and connect with them then. Any, you know, were you initially super comfortable being on camera? Any suggestions or tricks that kind of helped you overcome maybe any shyness or did it come really natural to you? Yeah, I, I will say I'm definitely a little blessed where I, to me, it doesn't matter. I am who I am. I do, I run day, I, I, I was in the hospital last week. I do run daily when I can. Ultimately, I, um, uh, my point is I am who I look like. I love eating sweets. I love eating food. I might have a double chin at certain angles. I don't care. This is how I sound, right? The people that you're shying away from maybe, or really it's a self-limiting belief yet, yeah, you know, so, so I guess my point of that is I don't really care what people think in a nice way. Uh, obviously I want to conduct myself. My dad's always taught me my re reputation is the one thing I can't take with me when I leave the room. Right. But um, I am, you are who you are. You be you. People already know you. They know what you look like. They know how you sound. Go for it. You are your own biggest critic. So for me, I didn't really care what kind of comp, trust me, I was in a fraternity. I have plenty of, of guys that will critique my videos in, in manners that I probably don't uh, want to hear or see, but you know, it is what it is. It, you know, you're putting it out there. What would you be? But I also, those same people, you know, uh, not to my horn, but my kid's college paid for theirs isn't right? Find out um, at a better way to say it. Who cares what people are thinking if you're getting this result? So if you have that self-limiting belief, you know, push it aside. You are who you are. Be proud of who you are. Be proud of what you put out there. Um, you know, I, I don't do any fancy. I don't do any filters. You're not going to see that stuff because you know, I am who I am and I love who I am. <laughs> you should too. <laughs> it's all about authenticity, right, Cabot? 
Absolutely, right? So a question. Perception is uh, reality. A question from Carol was saying, you know, you know, with you being in Florida, in the things that you've talked about today, you know, you have you found this to be a great strategy for it being a second home market? Are your folks majority like your your the folks coming in? Are they primarily out of area people or locals? Yeah, so my market is more primary residents. Um, we, of course, we do have that. Uh, we do have secondary, and there's I, I can go on another class another day anytime about maybe infiltrating the the uh, housing market, I guess, if you will, what absentee owners is what the word I'm looking for on, on doing those. I have a whole other campaign I do for those folks, especially when the pandemic hit. But, um, you know, that's, to me, it's more primary. Yes, I, there are pockets of Florida, right? Everybody thinks we're the beach where I'm still 35 minutes from the beach. So, you know, those beach towns that are a little bit more west of where I'm actually located, they're going to be a lot more transient second home, you know, snowbird condos, those kind of, those kind of clientele. So um, I think personally that you can implement this anywhere. One thing I, I wanted to address, which I think ties into this question too, um, you know, working exclusively by referral, I know where my money is coming from, right? I'm not paying for leads. What I'm doing is I'm searching the similar hashtags that I'm going to see on social media. The same things I told you to do on marketing your home for those interest groups, I am becoming the consumer and finding agents, high producing agents that are in those markets, California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, wherever it is. And I'm picking up the phone call, I'm talking to them because some of them maybe have access to a referral relocation network, maybe something, maybe not everybody's in, in Century 21, right? We have a huge network. So take advantage of just the other guy not doing that or the other guy or girl. So call them and introduce yourself, follow up with an email. I have never, and I feel those phone calls often, I have never had an agent where I call and just say, hey, I just want to let you know I serve the Tampa Bay market, you know, had, I don't toot my horn, but I let them know they're not, you know, I, I just be transparent. Like you said, authenticity, be authentic about it, but, but put your, let your confidence be heard through the phone. So if you need a, you need a role play or, or script, Google my name, you'll probably find my phone number. I'll, I'll bounce around and do ideas with you. I don't mind, but do, um, you know, do that. And then I've gotten a lot of business by, by I'm the only option. <laughs> right. So they already know that I will do and work up a referral agreement with them. We've already talked about things of that nature. When, it, when it's time, I don't call them and say, Hey, I'll send me 25%. I'll give you all your clients. Nothing like that, but just introduce yourself, have an introduction, follow it up. Because when somebody does move to Florida, which happens often, in, right. We all want to retire to Florida, it seems, but they can go in their email. They can type in Florida, Tampa Bay. They can type in keywords. They'll find your name, but of course you're following up with them and they'll send you business. It's been pretty successful. Yeah, but I love the fact that you are doing the homework and reaching out to agents within those areas that are moving to your local area. And for folks um, on the call right now who may not understand where they can find that information, when we look at the Golden Ruler Report, it does tell us that where those online views are coming from. And unfortunately, we don't often ask enough or reach out to other agents. And so as when you look at that report or you do understand where folks are moving from, to make that connection is going to give you such a stronger opportunity for them to then reach out to you when they do have that referral. So I think that was a great tip for our folks that are tuned in with us today. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, you, you're not, I don't mean to interrupt, you're not going to be that age. Like everybody you call is not going to be ready to buy or sell a home, right? You just need to be consistent. You need to follow up. You need to make those connections. You need to be top of mind when they either are buying or selling. They know somebody buying, they know somebody selling, right? So stop taking days off. <laughs> Probably the easiest <laughs> way to say. Oh, a quick, quick, want to respond to Keith asking what the report that I was talking about, um, the gold golden ruler report. So if you go into Century 21 University or even into 21 online, type that in, um, you'll get some additional information. We have a video in the university to kind of walk you through that, but it is something that the brand provides to you. So definitely take advantage of it. We have another question from Christopher asking, how long did it take you to go from part-time to full-time? That's a great question. Uh, for me, two years. So if you want to get really technical, I've been doing this actively for four years. Um, August 2017, I sold my first home ever. Uh, that was August. I finished up with seven sales that year, put all that money in the bank, saving it, right? I'm still a cop. She was still a teacher. The next year I worked, mind you, cops in my schedule, we worked six months on, six no. Well, we work six months out of the year. It's not six on, six off, but over uh, how it works out, 
six months of my year, I'm in a patrol, in a uniform, driving a patrol car. The other six months of my year, I was, I was a trying to sleep, have a personal life, have a baby. And then of course, work on my real estate business. So I did 23 transactions, you know, which was to me about, it was about 12 million in sales uh, last uh, 20, I'm sorry, 2018, all those sales. So I've now I have 30 transactions. That was about 18 million bucks in, in commissions. I had 18 million bucks. I, I would probably already retired if I had 18 million bucks, but um, in those commissions, and then what I did is I bought myself out because it's scary. I understand that as a part-timer, it's, it's scary. This is going to be, you're now going from, I mean, what's more probably job security, maybe not with the current times, but a, a paycheck every other Friday is usually government work, right? So I went from that, that was, that was comfortable, great benefit to now commission only. You're paying for your own insurance, all this other stuff, but it was the greatest leap. It's just, it's scary. And I get that. So, you know, grind work for it because you're going to get it. They're not going to give it to you, but it took me that long. And then early 2019, my wife and I had a discussion. I wanted to have at least nine months of savings. So I knew that if I sold one house a year, I'm sorry, one house a month for the entire year, that based on my average price point, that was going to, uh, so 12 homes, that was going to make me, this, I would be the same at what I was making as a deputy after taxes and paying my insurance and that kind of stuff. So do those numbers, be comfortable, but it, to me, two years, two years, and then it's been the best decision I ever made. Love it. Um, Blanca wants to know when it comes to client reviews, are you asking your clients? Are they just sending them to you? What's your process or strategy for that? Yeah, that's a great, it's a, that's a great question. So um, I'm probably the worst at asking for reviews. I ask for referrals often. I ask for referrals once I've proven myself and I do that multiple times throughout the transaction, but I'm only, you know, I'm not sitting at the listing table and, and saying, Hey, I'd love to put your home up for sale. By the way, do you know anybody else looking to sell? Right. Not the time to ask for a referral. I'm going to do that when I bring them an, a, a, at the high points. All right. Not when I tell them that their home failed the inspection. Right. But I'm going to do it when I bring them multiple offers, we go under contract above asking price, those kind of fun high points. I'm going to say, hey, I was just actually talking to my wife the other day. Do you know anybody else looking to buy or sell? Like, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure I could help X amount of families. That's the script I took from Jared James. But basically, hey, my wife and I really wanted to help 50 families this year. You know, I'm halfway there. Whether you're halfway there or not, I tell people I'm halfway there. Um, and that's, that's how I've helped find where if, I, if they have a target in mind, if I know that I'm trying to do 50 families and I tell them that I've already done 27, I'm looking for the 28. They're kind of, to me, it's just had a little bit more success with moving that into, um, they will find those, uh, like they're, they're going to try to help make you fulfill that. Um, that makes sense. I don't know. Um, sorry. Uh, my computer screen, I'll move it out. I'll make it really weird. Anyway, so, so yeah, so they, um, you know, they are uh, I, I, reviews. One thing that I need to get better at, I don't want to be the one to answer that question because I'm terrible at it. Referrals, when it's, when I've proven myself after the closing, I'm not going to say, Hey, I know you're trying to get into your house right now. Can you have, you have, you know, do you have a name for me? No, no, no. Like, do it when it feels organic, make it natural and just ask because ultimately if you've done the service, if you provided the experience, if you've done something that they would want to refer, I think you're fully, you, you've earned the right to ask for that referral. And if you think that, okay, I did a good job, they're gonna tell me, they're not, just be prompt about it. They don't, they know, I mean, everybody knows real estate agents are commission based, okay? Don't come car salesy off, you know, don't be a, a car salesman about it, but just, work it in there organically. And I, I found that basically any of the high points and any time they're, you know, they know your commission base. They're going to, uh, they're, they want to refer you if you've given them a service worthy of a referral. And if you don't feel that way, they probably shouldn't be asking for one. Um, but that, that's how I do it. Um, I hope that answers that question. No, that was, that was great, Cabot. And we are um, at the end of our session and I cannot thank you enough for all of this wonderful information that you have shared with us today for taking your time to spend with us today because we know how busy that you are. Um, <clears throat> any final questions? Uh, we've got about two minutes left to go and otherwise, hopefully you all can join us in tomorrow's session, but know that this session was recorded. You can go and watch that playback um, multiple times if you want. It will be available for a limited time. Did somebody have a question? I thought I heard somebody come off mute. Okay, great. Um, 
One final question for you, Cabot. How do you start your day? Do you have a magic miracle morning? What's your What's your process? No, this is awesome. So it's actually my favorite part of the day. Um, I'm an early riser. I crash really hard at night, so I, I'm pretty pest. I'm not a night owl. So I'll wake up early. What I do is I go for a run. I try to get some sort of exercise in. I'm big on morning routines. I think they're super important. I'll go for a run. I take a cold shower. I just like the way it wakes me up, and here we go. Then I drink decaf coffee. I, don't, I just like the taste of it. So I'll have a cup of decaf coffee with my daughter while she has her breakfast. I do that every morning. And then I know that my day, you know, was complete. And then I go out there and I grind because I just had a meal. I want to do that every day. I want to be there in the morning. I want to be able to take her to school, all that good fun stuff when she's old enough. But if I'm not putting in the time and I'm not getting her mind, you know, like that's, that's how I start my day. And then I get right in there. Time blocking is huge. Not to get into that topic, but make sure, you know, if you don't, the whole thing, if you, if you, you don't plan to fail, you fail to plan. So don't be distracted by the emails. Don't be distracted by the little things that are going to come across. If you need to go and prospect and make phone calls, that's what I usually roll right into. Do it. The emails will be there. Okay. Like Jerry James says, new business trumps old business. So I'll work on that. I hope that, I hope that helps. That's one more real quick one. Did you hire a mentor? Yeah. Not, well, so, you know, I, um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I have a great mentor who got me into this business and part of the century 20 system. That's why I'm here. Um, I did go into coaching uh, on two different platforms and I'm not going to, I don't want to call them out because I, I did, I'll tell you this. I learned more from both of them on their free channels, their free stuff, the, the stuff they're putting out there free than I did in, in really any of the one-on-one -on -one sessions that I did explore. I did, I did about, about six months on, a, on two different avenues. Um, but I will say, and I if I could go back, I would have saved that money and I would have just focused on what I can find on the internet from multiple channels and really right in there in the Century 21 stuff. We have so much good free stuff. You really don't need to go anywhere else. But yeah. accountability is important. So if it works for you, great. Get an accountability exactly. partner too. Sometimes that's cheap. Well, Kevin, as we close out, I've said thank you multiple times now, but I do want to read this final note here from one of our participants. OMG, exclamation point. This is one of the best <laughs> sessions I have heard addressing self-confidence, real tips, awesome. and nice processes. You gave much to put into practice today. Great. Awesome. I'm glad. Thank you awesome. so much. Everyone have an Fantastic afternoon. Thank you so much for joining our session today. And again, we hope to see you again in, in the near future. Have a great Thanks. evening. Bye, everybody. Thank you.